Hello and welcome to Conversations in Sunglasses. I am your host, Glenn Clark, and this is my new slave, uh, Mason Pelt. All right. Asaurus Rex the Fifth. Welcome to my stupid idiot internet show, Mason Housewife. You know, it's pretty good. It's amazing how we still have podcast microphones after COVID. I thought they ran out. Yeah, I know. I, I tried to kill them all, but... Yeah, yeah, everybody you have to buy enough of them. Right? You know, like I'm one of the people who waited till after the pandemic to start doing all the internet stuff. During the <laughs> pandemic, I just sat there and cried pretty much. I just sat in the dark and waited to die. You know, it, it upended my life to a tremendous extent. Um I know it did everybody's, but yeah. I think it was like March twelfth. I I remember thinking, Oh, this is gonna be interesting by like March seventeenth. I had about every client that we were working with at the time use the act of God clause to uh, terminate or alter our, our contracts in some way. So I stopped earning money at that point. For oh, bit. yeah. 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 I stopped earning money for a bit, too, because I was driving Lyft. And then, you know, pandemic, oh. nobody's going anywhere. <laughs> it sucked. I'm glad that's over. Now we have a new hell to live in. Like, it's always hell. Welcome to hell. Truly, it is. But that's Barely just me. That's just that's just being optimistic. So, uh, tell us, tell us about you. Tell us the thing, the many fascinating things you do. Okay, so I'm a world record holding <laughs> juggler. That's probably right, the right. most interesting single bullet. All right. Um, work in marketing. Have worked yes. in marketing for a long time. And attempting to transition careers into something akin to nursing or public health. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Just because, well, so one of the, the only marketing projects that I feel like has had more than a resume bullet, but really interesting is something called Project Hand Up, which is uh, Hand Up is an acronym. It's a Healthy Africa, a new directive using puppets. Interesting. And, uh, it started uh, my friend Darren Collins, fantastic humanitarian. Uh huh was training puppeteers in Kenya to do shows, teaching uh, HIV, sanitation, education, that sort of thing, difficult topics under the Jim Henson premise of if you can abstract it and it's puppets, people will listen and be less offended. And that started right. as puppet shows in schools. And then mm -hmm. during 2020, that organization uh, shifted and it became um, most of the public health messaging for COVID, most of the public uh, service announcements in Kenya and, and broadly that region of well, both East and West Africa, in fact, um, had a lot of project hand up stuff. So that organization won an award. Um, it's essentially a Kenyan Emmy, but the uh, Kalashnikov of International Film Award for Best Television Advertisements with Ask Dr. Pomoja, which means all together now in Swahili. Okay. And, uh, it's a, yeah, it was fascinating. I'm just kind of looking at what do I, what am I able to do? And I was like, if I became a nurse, mm -hmm. I already know how to fix public health messaging is largely just marketing. It's the same core set of skills. There's some epidemiological stuff that is also part of public health. I don't want to discredit the people with their, their masters in public health of the world, but yeah. it, it is largely a messaging and distribution job. And if you understand the health side of it, and you already understand. So I'm trying to come up with some way I can pivot my career to something that isn't just uh, soul crushing and uh, time intensive money bleeding with a tremendous amount of risk in a way that uh, doesn't just throw out 14 years of experience. Right. That That is the dream. You can tell I've been having job interviews, Tank. Right, right. I feel like you're interviewing. I'm about to hire you. I can't yeah, I pay know. you I'm anything, very, but very you're hired. You've got the job. What are you drinking there? Fake coffee. Fake coffee? Yeah, fake. It's got no caffeine. Oh, that's yeah. actually, you know, while it's an underserved market, the fake coffees, as you put them, are the real coffee drinkers. They're the people that want it without the drug. Right, right. We want the nasty flavor, nothing else. The nasty flavor the and the heat. Coffee. I like the smell of coffee way better than the taste. I don't know. I don't mind the taste, but... Did you, related to nothing, see that Mike Tyson is going to fight Jake Paul? What? No. Oh. July 20th um, this year, 
there's a fight and the rules and I don't want to get anything wrong, but my understanding of the rules are that first of all, Jake Paul will be allowed to fight at any weight, whereas Mike Tyson must fight at 160. In his professional career, I think he fought at like 220 to 240. So right. okay, down a lot. Um, Mike Tyson will be drug tested. Jake Paul will not. Well, that's weird. Yeah, I mean... no. So any PEDs you want. Jake Paul has headgear. Um, to protect which isn't his ears, do as much as they say to prevent him from getting brain damage in the future. But well, you know, it's what just difference an would it thing. make? And he's allowed to tag team his brother in at any point. And here's the thing. The Vegas odds do not favor Mike Tyson very heavily, but I, I am still watching this thinking if Mike Tyson wanted to, even at 58 years old or however old he'll be at that point, he should be able to take the arms of one Paul brother and, and just beat the other one to death with them. Oh, see, that would be worth the price of admission. I would, I would watch just to see <laughs> Mike. Like, I want to just see Mike Tyson go in and be like, all right, let's do this. Oh, he is unconscious. The end. Yeah, I would you love like, that. You know, the roll credits, right? That's perfect. <laughs> but social but, media has changed <laughs> for its forever. Yeah, for real. Like, that sounds ridiculous to me. Like, I, I want Mike Tyson to bite through the headgear, rip off his ear, get a good taste for it, and then just eat him in the ring. I that would be think glorious. About that. I didn't even think about that. The headgear is just to protect <laughs> To protect his ears. Yeah. <laughs> Because, like, if you take a, a spray paint can, that little ball inside, hear it. There's no amount of bubble wrap you can wrap the spray paint can in at which the ball isn't going to bounce around. Right. That's a head and a brain, right? That's that's what it is. So we're just wrapping more bubble wrap. Around. But the ear protection, now that I can say. Oh. Yeah. Jeez. Jeez. And Mike Tyson. Is he only 58? I think he will be 58 in this fight. I think he's 57 oh. right now. Really? I thought he was like much older than that. I thought well, he was Well, you gotta like, keep in mind, he was champion of the world at like 19. I didn't realize he was that young. Yeah, he was a baby when okay. he was the world champion. And has one of the like you know, bittersweet stories. Uh, yeah. Which is that his his boxing coach Castamato, a fantastic boxing coach, and trained many like fantastic fighters before Tyson. Yeah. But probably not a great dad. So when Tyson's <laughs> mom died, Tuss adopted. Mm -hmm. And Tuss had him doing meditation to learn how to be more aggressive, but apparently he never learned how to turn that off. And he did become the world champion. He did become incredibly aggressive in the last like five years. It seems like Mike Tyson has had his Monk Tyson arc. And he became mm. this very contemplative right. man. Obviously, you know, Andrea, my, my significant other, and uh, when she was a rehab counselor, she used to play a clip of Mike Tyson talking to Bill Burr on a podcast because Mike Tyson goes full. Don't give me that. Don't tell me. Why am I mad? Who hurt you? You know why you're mad. <laughs> it's the therapy session I've ever seen, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> but Mike Tyson became like a monk, and I think a lot of people don't follow that anymore. Right. That's I don't really remember how aggressive he once was. I'd like to see them do a Rocky movie like that, where he just becomes a monk. Oh, yeah. Rocky just... suddenly coming down, just becoming yeah. a normal person, a nice person. <laughs> right. He's got no man. more junk in the basement, nothing to fight for. He's just like, hey, why don't we step out of the ring and just talk about our feelings? Like, take off that the gloves and hold hands. And yeah. <laughs> I think you know I'd still go see it. I like Rocky I, movies. I would. Um, <laughs> so, what is your um, opinion? On I hate it. Fucking no. with time. I mean, you got to use protection for okay. one. Uh, like you mean like time travel, right? Oh, or, I, I mean the time travel we choose to do twice a year in America. Aha! I thought Arizona. that was my second. That was my second guess. Because I feel like we break our time every single six months. Right, right, and this is supposed to be the last time, right, that we uh, spring forward and then we just stay put, right? I've heard that before, so I don't know. I think so, um, and I think it's you know, it, it's not really like. A, 
it's outdated. It's almost just as pointless to end it as it is to keep it going. It really doesn't make a difference. It's just what time does it get dark? Here's where it will make a difference. Um, when we when we lose an hour mm -hmm. every year, right? That is the highest number of traffic fatalities in a single day. Oh, I don't doubt in that. the United States every single year. Yeah. So we could um, fix that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is alone worth it, but that's just me. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, this is, this is, as I understand it, to be the last one. Because uh, the legislation passed, I think, was it last year? So may then. It, um... May it rot. <laughs> right. Like, I won't miss it. Not at all. Um, because it's just it's annoying and it's stupid like what's the point but yeah i'm i'm glad it's gone but i feel like you know what i thought was weird it's like because it was a republican senator i think who uh got this done and i'm like mm -hmm. okay so i guess now you can say you've gotten something done but what about the things that matter you know <laughs> like it's like you, you know, can get daylight saving time fixed and people will be like, cool, we hated that crap. But it's, you know, what are you doing about gun violence? What are you doing about the minimum wage? It's at least we don't have to spring forward and fall back. Which is like, about I always, what? so immigration is not oh, yeah. for me a passion issue, but uh -huh. um, operational efficiency is a passion issue of mine. Right. Now, the Republicans have spent the whole of my living making issue of immigration. Right. Every every Republican. I, I mean, at, at at least a federal level. Uh -huh. Issue of, of immigration. And then Biden proposes, hey, oh, I, I don't remember exactly what was in that border package. Oh, right. The Republicans go against it, not because they disagree with it, but because, because they wanted to be able to let their, you know, patriarch, I guess, Trump and man campaign on the fact that Biden hasn't done anything about immigration because it's right. just a talking point. And it's the same exactly. reason. Exactly. They don't want the their op, their opponent to have a victory and that that's what they care about. They want to be yeah, like, it's, Look, it's, Biden's not doing anything about immigration. Well, neither are they, because when they get in a bill to vote for, they vote against it just so that biden won't have a victory so you can't tell me they really think there's that it, big a crisis at the border it's forever war. i mean like look it's the same thing roe v wade was the law of the land for a very long time yeah and it was never codified in the right it was it was just an interpretation through, yeah you know interpretation yeah and uh it could have been codified at any point by the democratic party who right at multiple times had you know, collect all three, right? You know, Senate, House, and, and presidency. They could have railroaded through. Oh yeah, and codified the law. They didn't because they wanted to be able to campaign on. It. And like right. my political campaign experience is pretty thin. It's just uh, you know, John McAfee and Berman Supreme. I was going to say, <laughs> interesting folks. I mean, I I do have a, the two. And I did meet a lot of people through that. And I kind of came to understand like the level of just pettiness across the board. Yes. Um, or what pe pettiness in terms of very small decisions made for very small reasons, the way right. I should do that. Right. Um, was quite hot. Um, at one point, I had a conversation with a campaign manager who wanted me to sign a non disclosure agreement to protect the identities of their donors. Now, here's the problem with that. Uh, after 91 days, by law, every donor to every federal political campaign ends up publicly uh, listed on the FEC website. There was nothing to protect. It was a, it was a pointless. Right. Like, I don't, I still kind of don't understand how that was a thing. And I, I messaged, you know, any lawyer I knew at the time, I was just like, hey, you want to see something funny? And they all found it funny, but it's, it's basically a. Uh, People get really, at that point, what had happened was someone said, well, I said there needed to be an NDA, and they didn't have a reason for it, because they were just playing business. 
And then I told them that I wouldn't sign it. And I didn't say why. And they, they came up with the reason. I was like, your reason has just said you plan on violating federal election law. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. It, 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 are you planning on violating federal election law or not? Because either you didn't need this document or whatever. And they just stopped responding else because uh you know pettiness right it's easier right. they chose the easier option because otherwise yeah. you'd have to admit one of two things and i i think i know which one it's, oh we, we planned on complying with the election laws i just oh, made a big crap. deal out of a pointless you know quasi enforceable legal document right which in all fairness i could have signed and it wouldn't have mattered because there was nothing to protect so it doesn't protect anything but I'm right able, and i wasn't being paid and you know oh well then screw that <laughs> Jeez. they know the campaign they don't tell me the guy with the boot on his head is under the impression his campaign is super serious <laughs> i know for real like, like mean, you can't tell me we're like oh we better not arise across our t's on this one lately right i mean okay so we're talk about free ponies for all americans mandatory tooth brushing laws don't <laughs> right okay so who's better like you've worked with vermin supreme i mean okay. talk about that for people who don't know who that is and then tell me at like well no i'll have questions after you can just talk about vermin supreme introduce us if you will so to that vermin. job you had and who you were working with if you look up it's, it's old enough now that it's resurging on tiktok but shmo <laughs> yoho from the 2010s of youtube uh -huh. used to do songify this uh, auto tune the news uh, those were the two names they did a thing with i think it was jared leto and they had um vermin supreme on it because he what he he campaigns for political office as a joke highlighting and satirizing right the process from what the process right he's a satirical and politician basically from the handful of conversations that i have had with him, he is one super smart if he's not a genius, I would be genuinely surprised. Incredibly uh -huh. intelligent. Um, and he has a ton of, of heart in terms of what he feels is just and unjust. Right. And what he thinks is fair game to satirize and not satirize. Um, and he, in any other world, would be as much a politician as any of the politicians. Well, as any of the politicians right when you think of that right right 2008 politicians yeah that we've ever had um it, it, when i say he's brilliant like he could in the way mitt romney did run bank capital he is he is absolutely intellectually capable of that he just doesn't want to and he's a performance artist and he's satirizing things, and he is sincerely commenting on in the style of ben franklin and john stewart because i do think those two merit being in the same conversation mm-hmm those I issues, see that. you know, and, and brilliant. Mm -hmm. The issue then becomes, how do you scale that? And my thought was, okay, well, we run an e-commerce store. I've run e-commerce stores before. I, at the time, have agency backing. Mm -hmm. um, we can cost a little bit of money. I knew some people to do media funding, which is less feasible. Media funding is where you print a bunch of goods. Someone gives you money, and uh, you use that money to advertise the goods and uh, make back the money to pay back the loan and making profit off of the cost of goods. And if you can't do that, well, they take the goods and they sell them at whatever price is necessary in order to pay back the loan, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was what I thought we would do. We didn't get to that point because um, the campaign wasn't well organized. And it wasn't well organized because it's performance art. Right. So like, Everyone was kind of engaging in performance art. The campaign manager was engaging in performance art wherein, oh, well, real political campaigns have NDAs, which not for the reasons you, okay. Real, right. real campaigns also pay people who run their e-commerce. And since I wasn't paid, like the cost of my saying no is nothing. So there's no reason, there's no incentives at play within this negotiation for me to go forward. Mm -hmm. um, and what I wanted to do is just make some urban spray merch, put it up on a website and allow him to do his thing. Yeah. Um, before that, when I'd worked with McAfee, there were a few. <laughs> that years. could have been interesting too. <laughs> well, so the same year McAfee ran, a guy mm -hmm. named Lawrence Lessig. Do you know who Lessig is? 
Yeah, I know. I'm familiar okay. with the name. Founder of Creative yeah. Commons, right. uh, Harvard professor of law, truly brilliant. Man. And he ran as a Democrat to be a referendum candidate. That was his quote. And it was the most saccharine, most beautiful campaign I've ever seen. Because he said, uh -huh. what I want to do is get money out of politics and then step down. Because I'm only running to do one thing. And his goal was to run in a way that forced that issue to be discussed. Nice. And McAfee and I had several conversations. And he is also, I mean, he is smarter than anyone I've ever met. And I've met some outliers. Um, mm -hmm. Probably intelligent man. Um, he was going through some degree of, I would say, cognitive decline that would escalate, probably caused by drug use. Right. But he wanted to be a referendum for cybersecurity and parents. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes sense. He definitely knew about that. Like, I created the antivirus. I don't think anyone right. argues McAfee wasn't knowledgeable about this. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the people he had to talk to uh, were super knowledgeable. And my thought was, hey, I could I could work on this. And then it just kept getting derailed. It was kind of this thing where a bunch of people thought they could kind of write their own ticket off of him and form him into whatever they needed him to be. And so he's pulled in too many different directions to do the thing. The one thing he said, eventually I um, removed myself from that campaign and all other business relationships. Right. But he was um, no doubt interesting. He's a collection of, of strange stories <laughs> from, from that era. Uh -huh. Most of them some negative memories, but he did. He, what I would say, I haven't seen all of the different documentaries that have been made about him. Right. But what I would say is there's a tendency for people to put him in the bucket where he's just this kind of crazy man that got lucky once and was fully crazy and a complete monster and sex pervert and whatever else. And I think he cultivated that image mm. without deliberately it or true he just wanted the mystique because it was easier for him to deal with this mystique of all of those things than it was for him to deal with what he really was which was a a very intelligent normal person who was severely depressed and had a terribly traumatic childhood mm. and out of that did some impressive things but was constantly coping with pain and um, I don't want to say he did or did not do anything because there are living people who have made claims about stuff that he has done, which hurt them and which I was not present about to be knowledgeable of. Fair. But what I would say yeah. is it was someone who is much more complex than the monster that he is often painted and much more human than the person that uh, his greatest fans paint him as. You know, that's probably every monster in history is, you know, far more complex and not just monsters, but every good person, you know, yeah. everybody, everybody who's painted as a pure good or a pure crazy or a pure evil or a pure anything that's horse crap because everyone is a fully nuanced human being. You know, everybody's got facets. For sure. And I think he has, you know, I've known, I know people who had known him for you know 20 years prior to when i would have met him mm -hmm. and talked about kind of some of the ways he changed and evolved with time and i mm -hmm. think he was dealing with some uh progressive cognitive decline over time i didn't talk to him uh, i i don't want to say it all in case there's ever a, a trial but i don't recall talking to him for the latter two to three years of his life right um and so he is, speaking of resumes, the story that people ask, what's your biggest failure? And I'll go, no. <sighs> do you want the one that could have been avoided or the one that could? Oh, like, so let's fast forward to the end. Um, an old client, boss, whatever you want to call them of mine, uh, took their own life in a Spanish prison evading U.S. taxes and quite possibly not certain of their own identity at the time they did it. There's not a lot of things I could have done that would have avoided that, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Um, and, and that had been a progressive thing. It wasn't like it just started. It had been a, a slow burn. And uh, I do think for what it's worth, 
he sincerely did want to be a force for positive. Yeah. Um, when he went to Belize and was planning on developing drugs, uh, not like party drugs, he wanted to develop cures for several things. Right. And um, it is it is my belief that he was uh, at least at certain points attempting to do just that. And I asked him, how, how would you think of doing that without any background? He's like, well, I'm going to butcher it. He goes, I am really, really fucking smart. And if I have 10 years and I apply that intelligence to learning myself and mm -hmm. I hire people who know things and I read everything there is to read about a topic and I pay to have people verify what I know, there is no degree that I could not attain within 10 years. So if I'd said I was going to go get a PhD in this and then do the research, you wouldn't have added not at FPG, something to that. And right. I, I believe he meant it. And also, just to be clear, he, there was no PhD program he wouldn't have been able to complete based on his intelligence and sort of uh, willingness to study. He's the only person I've ever met and talked about having a period of their life where they legitimately read a book a day, where I thought, mm -hmm. you're not lying to me. Because he goes, well, I sold Mac to you for a bunch of money, had some time, so I would read a book every day. Dude. Yeah. I would do that if I had the luxury. Oh, I know you like there have been some Saturdays where I've done that where I just am like, you know what? I'm <laughs> up early. I'm gonna read this book cover to cover. And I do. But I can't do that every Saturday because it's kind of a, you know, the only well, I only really get like the equivalent of one day a week. Would you put the time I have each weekend to just lounge about and read? I've been trying to read more uh at night, just a little. But it frustrates me because it takes me a week to read a very short book. Can you do audiobooks <laughs> at all? Because you could maybe do those while you're working. That's true. But, you know, I don't know. I I haven't gotten into audiobooks. I could. I'm just, you know, that's what uh, one of my friends, Nick Aston, he, he and Zach both listen to audiobooks. But Nick, he'll be plugged in all day at work. He's always mm -hmm. listening to a book while he's working. And I love it because, you know, he's just... It's like he's just downloading all this information while he's doing stuff. So it's not that I'm opposed to it. I've been listening to the, uh, is it called A Thousand Arabian Nights in a Night or A Thousand Arabian Nights Plus One? The story I think share. it's a, a Thousand and One Arabian Nights. A Thousand and One, okay. I think that's what it's called. I could be yeah. wrong. So it's been a while. Been I read it, I think, for school, like mm -hmm. coming up on... 15 years ago 14 years ago something right. like, like 17 years ago maybe i don't know mm -hmm. but like more than more than a decade and so i didn't really remember it i was like oh well this is some sort of a cult classic and i should probably read it and uh so i started listening to that and i try to listen to two books at a time one fiction, one non-fiction because the fiction you can kind of fudge and the non-fiction book i listened to was um very different than what I expected. Are you familiar with um, The 48 Laws of Power by Robert? No, I'm not. No. Okay. Never heard of it. <laughs> so whenever I've read summaries, of it, the reason I hadn't listened to it ever is because all of the summaries make it sound like just sort of the guide to developing a conservatively a personality. Disorder. Right? They'll, they'll gotcha. some of, to the summaries. But really, it does seem to be a guide to behaviors that people who were focused on the pursuit of power had engaged in mm -hmm. within their days and green is clearly a scholar clearly well well read and, and uh i i took quite a bit from that book though yeah. i would not apply there's a lot of things i still wouldn't apply um to my life because i think that they are um, unhelpful and largely that's probably just the autism <laughs> you know mm -hmm. Like the the inability to accept that hey maybe that's good advice, but there is there is actually good advice in it. Nothing else I'd recommend reading it because um, odds are you're uh, the most sociopathic person you know chose to base their life on this particular piece of literature. Gotcha. And I don't think it's nearly as sociopathic as, as I had expected, though. Um, I, I I'm a little surprised you had uh, read it because it seems like something that you would be. Uh, 
in the same fashion as myself, uh, intrigued by because you met people that just unconsciously did this. Right. Well, I mean, I'm intrigued by it now, now that I've heard of such a book. But I yeah. mean, it kind of like I can't hear of every book, you know, <laughs> like, there's a well, lot of them out there. But it kind of makes me think of Machiavelli. Like it, the way Machiavelli comes it. up heavily as a hero, in some sense, within this book. OK. And that's sort of fascinating because like um, I have uh, this acquaintance of mine. Mm -hmm. um, in therapy, there is a term. There's no diagnosis in the DSM-5 or, to my knowledge, the ID-10 for Machiavelli. Mm -hmm. The therapist will sometimes write a note, high money, meaning someone is high in Machiavelli. And um, I have this friend or acquaintance that we've sort of referred to for years as, oh, hi, Mox, because he is the <laughs> most Machiavellian individual I have just ever seen mm -hmm. in so many um, unbelievable ways and uh anytime i'll see interesting him, oh hi mark um his name is not mark by the way oh, I, I figured <laughs> it's, it's it's one of those things that i'm like i'm certain he has had a therapist at some point that wrote that down it's like very high right. in machiavellianism very manipulative and it, it's it's just sort of odd uh the, mm -hmm. the tendency by which people behave in certain ways often this is my issue with narcissists right is i can come up with a straightforward way to get what they actually want right um, but they want to play with you they want to but play they're going to do food. these other they're going to do this other shit and it's like but i but this isn't even the most efficient way to get what you want what is your deal mm -hmm. um and part of that comes up because for for many years my job was was included sending bids and proposals for specific work often to startups because i swam in that swamp mm -hmm. and occasionally you'd meet these guys that like they didn't they didn't want what they said they wanted they wanted to win and by win they mean an interaction between myself on behalf of a vendor and themselves on behalf of a company and they would try to win that interaction even at right. the cost of, like growing their business and making more money and what have you and i was always amazed because you'd, you'd talk to people and occasionally you'd, you'd write down everything they said they want. And I don't mean like just in general at a bar. I mean like we're having a contract negotiated. You have requested services from us. We're figuring out what services you want based on the goals you've said you've had. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put that together. And if you gave them everything they ever wanted, they'd have a reason not to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I know was always exactly what you're talking about. It doesn't make any sense. And it, it, like I remember, there was one dude in particular that, like, somewhat recently, um, let's say within the last four years, it just short circuited my brain because I remember saying, "Everything you said you wanted." He goes, "I'm sorry if I didn't adequately communicate my goals." I'm like, it's not a matter of adequately communicating your goals. It's a matter of if everything you've said to me for a period of about four years has been accurate. Or like if this isn't accurate, you have been, you know, I don't know, I won't, I don't want to say lying because that feels conscious and deliberate, but you have been telling me a version of things which you did not believe, which is not real, even if you believe right. for four years. And that does not make me enthusiastic about trying to accommodate you. Right. Or work with you, because frankly, I do want to work with people who can clearly communicate their goals mm -hmm. so that I can then go and achieve them. Yeah, and who really know not. what they want but narcissists live in a state of delusion that's oh, yeah. just and kind of they live in a fantasy world it's it's a state of of dueling realities in which they are both mm. special and exceptional yeah and also in which they are um insecure and unworthy right and when you deal with both of those it's, it's actually very hard that's also seemingly according to the literature i have read how a narcissistic personality disorder tends to develop yeah is you're in childhood and for example you have a parent that treats you like shit on one day but also like if you don't like what's for dinner they'll make you your own separate dinner based right. on your preferences on one and hand so you're, you're a special. beautiful and unique snowflake on the yeah. other side you are a piece of shit that isn't worth my time and effort you and know that, and so you have to choose one in your head yeah like which one, duality, which one are you going to protect yeah so it's hard on you know? right so I think a lot of the times that I've dealt with narcissists, they're always hurt people. Right. But it just kind of becomes this thing. I, I made a TikTok today. Uh -huh. uh, it sounds weird to say, but um, 
someone was talking about growing up with emotionally immature parents. And one of my points is it really mirrors what I call the baby boss phenomenon in corporate America. Mm. So you have a boss, maybe it's nepotism, but let's just say it's not nepotism. Let's say it's that they were a recent MBA grad, but they have no technical experience or managerial experience, or they recently completed their engineering license, but have not done this specific type of equipment maintenance that they're now supervising. Right. So for a period of time, someone ends up with a, a baby boss. The boss is their boss, but cannot do the job that they are tasked with. And everyone kind of wants to continue having a job and maybe they want their company to succeed, all other things being equal. So you manage from below. Right. And the thing is, that is what I think a lot of the emotionally immature parent-child relationships mirror is having a baby boss with a key difference. The baby boss is sometimes able to grow up and uh, children will always grow up. I mean, barring severe cognitive impairment, mental illness, or, or death, children grow up. That's their whole mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, and that's what they do. Almost never do. So if you are a child of an emotionally immature parent, there's going to be power struggles that occur because while they are not getting better at being emotionally mature, the child is often no thanks to the parent, but they are. Mm -hmm. And so now you have the the extreme version of a baby boss, which is the nepotism hire, who just never should have had that job, and it becomes resentful and often jealous, and jealous people will tank even their own children uh, in terms of their ability to be successful because they, they view themselves as competing. And it's that sort of sense of competition that has caused going full back to corporate you send someone a contract and it's everything they said they wanted but you are paid fairly and they say no because you're paid too much right like you know and because of what i've done i would oftentimes have contracts where it's literally i'm paid a percentage of the value breaker which puts someone in a position of having to say oh you don't deserve 15 percent of the value you create you only deserve 10 mm -hmm. like wait a minute so you deserve 90 percent of what i create why right. is that right you know, why is that? Because it really takes the mask off. There's not much to obscure when it's just percentage of value created. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but people will uh, try to. Yeah, yeah, they will. Oi, gosh. It's like you're preaching to the choir. Mm. <laughs> like, these are all topics I've... I've been deeply immersing myself in lately, research-wise. Oh, I, I figured you'd experience this. Uh, hmm. Rest in peace, Whiskey Dave. <laughs> is your your audience familiar with the whiskey dave lore i'm not sure that was my dad's uh my dad's landlord when he moved to costa rica he was telling he's told me you know you walk you couldn't find they couldn't track him down you walk into any bar and there's whiskey day <laughs> and sclerosis of liver can get whiskey dave if you come for uh like i'd love it if that were his legal name so there's a film I watched last night. It came out on the set. And it is called um, Ricky Stadnicki. Uh -huh. Have you heard anything? I, I haven't heard anything about it. You're bringing me all oh. kinds of new things. Okay. That's good. So the, I idea, like that. the idea is, and it's not like a deep film, but it is super funny. Mm. Um, these guys go from childhood to, into their adult life lying about the existence of a person named Ricky Stadnicki. <laughs> He's their friend, you know. Ricky did it. Ricky did the bad thing. Ricky, How convenient, you know. Whatever. Ricky's this convenient excuse, but then they kept using him into adulthood. So Ricky is the reason. Ricky has cancer, and now they have to skip out of a wedding <laughs> and go to Dollywood or whatever. So yeah. Ricky is this convenient excuse. But they went so far. They created this fully fake person. He had his own Instagram. Mm -hmm. He had his own separate phone. All this shit. And then wow. eventually they kind of had their bluff called they hire an actor to play Ricky <laughs> And it's it's this amazing thing. I watched it twice technically. I watched it once kind of by myself all for the last 15 minutes, and once with Andrea. Yeah. It was not as enjoyable the second time. Mm. Because what made that film good was individual plot plot twists and turns. Gotcha. And if you um, know what's coming. So enjoyable. So I'm trying not to give anything away that matters. Okay. But it was highly entertaining. Highly entertaining indeed. And um, yeah, I, I just kept thinking about it because one of the 
things they gave Ricky, I'm not giving away anything from the story. They kept making him this brilliant humanitarian. It was this like fake human um, in the canon of that show. And I know, I mentioned him in the beginning, Darren Collins, who is this guy that I showed Andrea. I'm like, here's his Instagram. He's literally the picture of him at like a uh, film awards celebrating women in film in Kenya. <laughs> running his charity i'm like darren's real (laughs) (laughs) no and that guy has an interesting story because he only ended up in puppets because his brother uh was a puppeteer Mm -hmm. his brother had applied to work for jim henson got accepted to college his parents didn't forward his mail he comes back from college sees a letter from henson studios and it was a job offer to work for Jim Henson. Sweet. And it, he it was too late. So he gave Darren, his brother, all of his puppet stuff. Hmm. And Darren has taken that and run with it, I think. So we're not quite at Jim Henson level, though. Um, right. There is a letter in Darren's house in Kenya that is a, a very beautifully written email from Jim Henson's daughter. Yeah. Just appreciating kind of the, the work he's doing. Nice. I think that's beautiful. That is, that's fantastic. I love that story. And, you know, I mean, they do, Muppets do good things. Like, you've got, like, I mean, there is a a Muppet with AIDS, isn't there, on the, uh, one of the foreign versions of Sesame Street. Oh, I'm sure there is. We, yeah, the South African uh, version of of Sesame Street does, yes. I forget the name of the character. But, yes. Right. And, uh, and then, you know, yeah other issues of the day like you've got cookie monster tweeting out his dissatisfaction with shrinkflation oh so, yeah i that's... mean <laughs> i, I couldn't know. believe how much time shrinkflation got within the state of the union <laughs> like, see i haven't just... i haven't watched it yet to my shame i usually watch it in real time i was just so wiped out that day didn't even occur I, to me i've got a, I, I always try to watch don't know if it matters mm-hmm. um like, I don't mean that, like, a, if I consume this information, mm-hmm. what do I as an individual do? Right. And the answer is probably nothing. Because, right. like, I kind of know what's going on, first of all. But even if I didn't, I'm going to end up at the end of this, you know, crazy hoopla that we're going to have for the next year or two. I'm going to end up, well, not year or two, but for the next, for the remainder of this year up until November. Yeah. I'm going to end up dealing with a ton of campaign related shit. And I'm not going to vote for the guy who's going to be Republican. Just not, like, sorry. There is nothing that he could do that would change my unwillingness to ever vote for him. Right. Okay. Like, there's no, not nothing could happen, could be said. And I know that sounds like a very close minded. Like we already have but it's, years. Yeah, it's not close minded because you look at I mean, they don't have a platform. They're they don't have except they just what they're doing, like there's no way for the entire party to change by November that yeah. if you and have one good be, Republican, you know, it's not gonna make a difference. We we know it's gonna be Trump, right? Like we're not like, right curious about how that turns out. Mm-hmm. So I'm not voting for him. Right. Full stop. End of story. I have enough Same. data. I have enough data to say no. Uh-huh. It's sort of like going like, "Hey, do you want to go back to the abusive relationship?" No. Nah, nah. Right. No. Exactly. You were only in it for five years. Yeah. Yeah. I was in it for five years. Well, maybe he's changed. No, he hasn't. No, he has. He has. I don't there. care. Okay, I'm allowed to not care. So I know I'm going to end up ultimately sticking it up and voting for the Democratic nominee, who I also mm-hmm. already know is ultimately Biden. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's like that's all there is. That's all I need to know. Um, right. Do I agree with everything going on with Ukraine? Aid? Do I agree with everything going on with um, Israel? No. Do I agree with everything going on with immigration policy? Absolutely not. Do I right. agree with the long, long list of things I don't agree with? It is is a long, long list. But ultimately, I am going to be presented with two options. I already know what those options are, and I already know one of them is wholly untenable. Yeah. One of them and- is going to make everything way worse. The other, the worst they'll do is keep things the way they are. 
<laughs> you know, like, do I, I like we need a change? We need yes. things not to be the way they are. I agree. But, yeah. But I'm not it's... really in a position to demand that change. I can't make that change. Um, so I will focus on the things that I can focus on and try to improve those where I am able to. Right. And frankly, the state of the union, like I watched enough to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But like I think I owe society a, a duty to be basically informed uh, about yeah, and see, general things. That's why I like to watch the politicians talk. Even like I would always watch Trump give his terrible, insane speeches because then I'm not um, being fed sound bites, you know, with a with an agenda. Like I know exactly what was said when and in what context. You know, that's how I, I don't need a news anchor to tell me their um interpretation of what was said i don't need memes to inform me of people's political agendas and what they're saying and what they're doing i'll listen to them in their own words and that's why i would i'm going to go back and watch the state of the union from this year just so i can avoid um, misleading sound bites and memes and crap you know that's you know i respect that like i kind of watched what i what i i watched a little bit of it and yeah. was in and out throughout it. And I felt <laughs> like I got enough. Because yeah. again, because you... there's nothing there's <laughs> nothing that is going to be said in that environment is going to change anything about my life or perception of the world. Right. And nothing is really going to be revealed. It's kind of like we already know what this guy stands for or claims to stand for, you know? Yeah, I mean... And like, here's the thing: Joe Biden is just not across the board. Not my point. the guy that wrote the is it 1994 or 1984 crime bill. I don't remember which of the fours it came mm. out, which creates so many problems that persist today within how law enforcement operates and what their scope is. He is not going to. He's not going to reform the criminal justice system. At point. And I would argue he shouldn't even be in a position to have that option. We should mm -hmm. just say, hey, you, you fucked this up. You don't get to be the one to fix it. We will let other people fix the mess you created. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, like one of those things. Because, um, and it's, it, in my opinion, was blatantly racially motivated, but it mm -hmm. was changing the penalty for possession of cocaine versus possession of crack. Now, crack is cocaine mixed with baking soda, typically, and water to form a new type of of thing but the active ingredient is the cocaine mm -hmm. it's still cocaine you can use it differently whatever i'm not an expert on it, okay but it was about affecting a group of people that were disproportionately more likely to have cocaine and that was black or have crack rather than cocaine that was black americans because crack was cheap because it's called baking soda mm -hmm. Um, you know, things having to do with steroids that have still prevented people from getting uh, anabolic androgenic steroids, medically prescribed things like chemo and AIDS wasting disorder, came right. down to things Biden would say, which were, I would have been a professional ball player if all those people hadn't cheated and crying steroids. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, would have preferred if Biden had just stuck a needle in his arm to become a professional ball player, thus avoiding all of this. <laughs> well, we didn't get that that's not the world we lived in he didn't have the ball to use steroids so now we get to hear about his son's laptop even though his son's not running for office I, it, right like, yeah that's so annoying just i'm tired i'm sick of the non-issues being blown up into pretend issues like please <laughs> so what about you i mean okay have you ever considered running for office yourself in any capacity and if so, what would you do? What would be your platform? Okay, so the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, if I wanted to affect change, uh -huh. I've consistently seen that the most effective people at impacting change, by and large, you know, there are margins, you become the president, or whatever you may change, are people who find one issue and focus solely on one issue 
and try to impact change on one issue. I mentioned Lessig in the referendum candidacy earlier. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the goal for Mac, my goal, the cybersecurity campaign. Um, but if you want to affect change, focusing on one thing so narrowly that you can have the largest possible amount of people agree with you is good. Because what tends to happen is people have, you know, imagine just a, a stack of, of boxes, rows and columns, okay, cubbies. And then one cubby is a thing that you go, okay, 90% of people agree with what's in this cubby. And the next thing is a is thing that 90% of people agree with what's in that cubby, but it's not 100% overlap. You're losing people as you build your platform out with more and more cubbies. And eventually you get to where you might have 55% of, of people genuinely agree with most of what is right. in those cubbies. And that's a political candidate. It's all of those things. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on one issue and you say, I just don't think there should be any homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. I just, I just think if you were in the military, your cancer treatment should not only be free, but be prompt. Right. I think you should have access to mental health services. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think 90% of people. Uh, yeah, that. Who's not going to agree with that. I don't think most people would argue that. And so if I were going to start a charity and I, you know, or start an initiative, say not a charity. Right where I wanted to fix veteran affairs or oh, how about this one? Cause it's become, it's become a thing that's come up a lot is, is the state of barracks house. I should disclose. I was never in the U S military. I have no ties to the U S military. I'm, I'm just right. talking about the state of barracks housing, have mold and other issues that are maintenance. And you have some four star general stand up and say, Oh, it's a discipline issue on the part of troops. No, -uh. bullshit, bullshit. Go fix those. Go fix that stuff. And mm -hmm. I, if I individually wanted to try to impact that change, it is far more efficient for me to, to go to find some wealthy folks that also care about this issue and start some sort of initiative or campaign that says, hey, fix base housing for soldiers and actually impact change through politicians than it would be for me to become a politician. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be able to get people to agree because people who let's let's just pick a few issues. People who don't agree with me on abortion might agree with me on the barracks housing thing. People who don't agree with me on let's say right to repair might agree with me on the barracks housing. So you pick something that you're passionate enough to be really angry about and try to impact change on that one vector. And um, there's a guy that I I follow on the interwebs, Lewis Rossman. His issue is right to repair. Mm -hmm. And he has been an incredible advocate for that, largely because he has focused only on one thing. It's just, it is wrong for Apple and Samsung and everyone else to have parts which exist in a warehouse, but which cannot be sold to anyone other than Apple or Amazon or Samsung. Mm -hmm. Meaning your device breaks. And this drives up cost across many vectors. So there's phones, which is an obvious one. But how about hospital operating tape? where a part in a motor that could be replaced for under a few hundred dollars is unavailable and necessitates the entire apparatus be replaced for $30,000, $40,000. Like guess who pays that cost? It's everyone dealing with the healthcare system. And so my belief is in, if you want to be a politician, a politician, but if you just want to impact change, the way to do that is pick one thing that you are passionate about. Make sure you can get a, a tremendous 80 plus percent buy. -in. Yeah. And then push for that because I think most people are willing to support a series of mono issues and not willing to support someone that has five. But by the time I add five issues, I am going to be super bold. I probably don't have 30% of people who agree with me on all of them. That's a really good point. I never thought about it like that. That's. It's it's true for charities Accurate, too. The ones it's true. That seem to be the most successful seem to be the ones that focus on the most narrow mission. Mm -hmm. And I think about that a lot. So anytime I want to expand the scope of any organization, market, I think, well, how can we do more with a narrow focus? Mm -hmm. You know. So if you do, if you do, and this isn't to say you shouldn't be objective, but it's the kind of thing as an individual you should be. But when you're talking about impact and change, you mono focus. You said. This one thing, all the way, just this, you alienate as few people as possible. 
Mm -hmm. but if I if I said abortion is going to be polarizing, but if I said everyone in the military who got cancer because of their military service should finally receive free chemo, who's going to disagree with that? I mean, like no one is going to say people who hate. The military industrial complex aren't going to say the individuals who joined right. the of economic conditions yeah. and got cancer because they were exposed to carcinogenic substances tied to their service, which they didn't determine where they would be or, or how the U.S. would be involved or what supplies were used, that that person just should, should die. That's not a reasonable position at all. That's the least right. reasonable position I can come up with. You have to be dealing with a cartoon character mm -hmm. for someone to add. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there are cartoon characters out there, but they aren't they the majority exist. of people. So it's just that I think if you get the majority on on the same thing and you leave as few pieces as possible um, up for derailment, you are going to be more effective in in impacting any sort of positive progression towards what you want. And maybe you have to then go in and find 15 different organizations to support because they're all issues that you think are worthy of, of support. Right. But if it's a monofaceted or a monofocused organization, I think it has a greater chance of, of impact. Okay, that's good. I've learned a lot from talking with you today. Sir. How is your known book? What? Your newest book. How Wait. is your newest book? Oh, how is it? You yes. mean like the one that uh, the short fiction that just came out? The short fiction that just came out. How is it doing? I don't know. You know, I won't let myself look at the numbers for mm -hmm. a while. You know, because <laughs> I don't, I don't want to know. Like I'm scared. It's kind of like, um, like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg had this tradition of any time they had a movie opening, they ran away and hid somewhere because they didn't want to know. Like they'd go hang out together and just not watch what's going on. <laughs> I think that can be a valid, valid theory. Um, or you could just sit there and refresh a page. Yeah, and see, that's what I don't want to get stuck doing. It's like, okay, now how many sales do I have? How many? Because I've got two short stories. Like I've had, I had one come out in February and one come out in March. Oh wow! So, yeah, because I just released um, the Theomorph is a short story about a guy who can turn into a god at will. Okay, why is he not always a god? Well, you know, it's one of those short stories that's just kind of illustrating a point. Okay. Like, um, because he's a boy, like he's a person who basically has a message, and it's a message of love and peace. And so you have two kings who are each trying to use that to their advantage in a way that has nothing to do with his message. So, um, Hey, I, I've seen that with political candidates. It's yeah, really exactly. Derailed. <laughs> I think you just made a point that was everything I just explained in a book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all out. It's all the same. It all flows together. We're all processing what's going on in the world, you know? <clears throat> and, uh, yeah. Politicians are, Politicians are interesting folks, and they all have agendas, and they all... Well, one good thing, and it's my one good thing, I think, about politics, is a, an economist that... Uh, I, I go back and forth as to how much of what I've read of his I agree with, but uh, I would consider myself a bit of a disciple of Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. And one of his points concerning politicians is... They have no morals. They have no character. They have the fire. You don't need the best politician. You need to make it politically profitable for the politician to do the right thing. No, for real. Exactly. And therefore, for me, most of the time when it comes to elections, I don't care so much about who is elected. I care about being able to make it politically profitable, which goes back to what I said about the monofocused organizations. If mm -hmm. you make it politically profitable for someone to do the right thing, people who are focused on maintaining power, they'll do the right thing. Right, but only people because it on pays. Maintaining, maintaining power, they're going to do the wrong thing or the right thing in accordance with their own morality. Right. 
but you know p politicians their positions on an issue will change based on what's going to get them votes it's not really about their heart they don't have a change of heart they have a change of policy because they want to stay in power you know exactly it's, it's not about ethics to them for most there are there have to be exceptions but few and far between in my opinion there are very few successful politicians that are in it because of their hearts well, you know the political apparatus is built to prevent those people from making it through you know they, they filter out yeah exactly um, like so lawrence lessig mm -hmm. is arguably the hardest i mentioned his campaign earlier i'll mention it now he is at the time he ran in the 2016 election cycle a tenured professor of law at harvard impeccable record um long background in the democratic party and impacting meaningful change within organizations with the governments mm -hmm. um he is as credentialed the candidate as you were going to find who has not previously been i would argue and he ran with what i believe was a purely intention good heart of the campaign mm -hmm. to referendum one issue which was campaign finance and he was basically shut out entirely but he didn't even make it into the debates because they and I, you can go to Wikipedia and confirm that this is true, changed the rules for what number of you had to be at and what number of polls to prevent him from being in the debates. Mm -hmm. and there wasn't a Democratic candidate who was better at debating at that time, in my opinion. Yeah. And it was it is very difficult. Uh, even with the amount of tarnish that academia has gained for itself, and rightfully so in a lot of cases, to disregard, you know, tenured Harvard law professor mm -hmm. as, you know, a, a serious candidate for president. But it, just in my opinion, uh, he was a good person and he was shut out by the political activists. Mm -hmm. because of that. And I think because almost anyone he was a good person that, um, yeah. resist within the political apparatus. It does so because they can be controlled. Right. Are you familiar with Diddy? Diddy. Diddy. Uh, no. Oh, okay. So you are familiar. I'm going to learn Jeffrey more. Epstein. Say what? Jeffrey Epstein. Yes. You're familiar with that. Okay. What seems to have happened to Jeffrey Epstein is that he operated a lot of his stuff, to use the euphemism. <laughs> um, right. To gain blackmail against wealthy famous people. Mm -hmm. Did he seem to do the same thing based on the accusations? And it was within the music industry and entertainment industry largely. Um, and it's impressive how much blackmail he seemed to have across how many people. Interesting. And um, it seemed like that was kind of how he had his clout and power and control within the music industry was black so I mean I'm just sort of intrigued by how um, how influence tends to work uh, <laughs> because if you look at the origin of the FBI there's also um, some, some blackmail that allow it, it mm. to persist not just oh, not surprised in terms of how it operated as an organization but persist as an organization in terms of how it strong-armed other people uh, mm. into continuing its existence so i was hoping you would know more about that than me because i had questions but uh <laughs> leave that for another time well that's something i'm going to delve into now anything that you brought up that i don't know about i'm going to be the the, the diddy thing and then Deep you gotta watch the Cat into. Williams interview, which I, I will remind you. Okay, cool. For the Diddy revelations. You're familiar with the interview, right? With the what? The interview of Cat Williams and Shannon Sharp show. Oh, right. Yeah. So At yeah. First I just... thought you said the internet. I'm like, no, oh, I've no, never no, heard no. of it. Really the, the internet. But <laughs> that that interview where Cat Williams called that Diddy a number of times, um, including that he uh turned down I forget how many millions of dollars, millions of dollars several times from Diddy. Because he wanted to protect his virgin hole. <laughs> and then it, it, it is alleged okay. in court documents 
that Diddy may have filmed himself topping various famous men <laughs> so that he had something to blackmail them with. Allegedly, don't sue me. Right. Diddy. Yeah, you weren't there as far as anyone I, I, knows. As far as I anyone knows, there, you... I don't know. <laughs> You might have been the cameraman, but no one can prove that. You can't prove. I was can't never be, in the same room as right. that cameraman. <laughs> there are NDA agreements in place. There's. <laughs> that's why you need the purple. <laughs> that's the that's the truth. <laughs> All right. So what All else right. do we have to go over? What are the biggest news events of the day that must be addressed? You know, I don't know. There's. I think we covered it pretty well for an hour. For all right, I think we're at an hour, aren't we? A I little go, bit. Yeah, I go too far over an hour, and nobody will watch it. You know, I need to keep my three to ten viewers coming back. <laughs> for, no. Well, I mean, three to like one thousand seven hundred and ninety something viewers. Like oh, that video is still the, going. Yeah. Those are the the extreme polls of how many views my videos will get. You, you know what? You got to get on TikTok and just start posting some clips. Yeah, yeah. True story. <laughs> but uh, before we wrap up, is there anything you want to plug? Any stuff you do out there in the interwebs you want to uh, send well, people to? Look up Project Handa. The, the puppet related one, not the one yes. that does food in LA. I'm sure that's also where the organization. <laughs> um, and uh, if you if you have it in you to make a donation, make a make a small charitable contribution to an organization that is doing some sincere good. And if you want to follow me, um, Substack is kind of neglected, but it's Mason Pelt, and TikTok is also uh, Mason Pelt. So those would be the the places to find me. Should you you want more of whatever the hell this was. <laughs> that's about how i sell myself if you want more of this i don't you know. really know how to promote which is weird because i can tell other people how to promote. right right i get that. i do i've I done do. media training for people and, and it all goes out the window when you stick a camera in my face and i'm just like <laughs> fuck it let's talk about diddy raping dudes in order to right right well, you know, you're you're in the right place this uh anything goes here on my youtube channel all right well welcome to the sunglass hut right right you know what happens in conversations and sunglasses stays on sun conversations and sunglasses which is broadcast to the world so fair enough so you're safe you're safe here um but yeah See, anyway so my only fear is always that once it goes out on the internet, this one ends up being the one that gets 10 million views, but it's just one clip of me saying something totally untoward. Right. And it probably will be that way. That's probably the case. So just oh, bra brace yourself. That's you're, how you're going to be famous. Works. You're going to be. You know, there was a girl on the internet that, that was crazy because she didn't like store bought pesto. <laughs> what? No. Okay. So there's this human. Uh, I believe Susie something. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But she made a video which starts Call Me Crazy, but I've never liked Store Bought Pesto. And it was How to Make Pesto. Okay. And tens of thousands of people took the five seconds of the video where she goes, Call Me Crazy, but I've never liked Store Bought Pesto and made their own video where they confessed to legitimate crimes. So it would be like, Call Me Crazy, but I've never liked Store Bought Pesto. <laughs> I'm growing no like store about pesto. So anyway, when I was eight, I broke into a school <laughs> that all of the computers on fire, or, you know, whatever it was. I drove a tractor through a police station. I mean, it was some legitimate, like, legitimate admission to crimes uh, in response to this because the internet is just nuts. No, yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. It's so like I look forward to becoming an immortal so that I can watch the uh, future historians in a thousand years try to figure us out. Like, because all that stuff is going to, there's going to be meme archaeologists. They're going to be oh, digging yeah. through old websites. They're going to find, they're going to find TikTok intact, buried in a link somewhere and learn about our time and our people. And it's, it's going to be weird. Like the future of anthropology is data science. <laughs> oh all right so uh 
before I forget to sign off, because I see that's my uh my weakness is I could keep doing these for like just ten hours. I could just keep going. Hey, Joe but, Rogan's had some seventeen hour podcasts. That's true. That's true. But he is Joe Rogan. So I think we're gonna call this one. We're gonna All right. stay time of death. But it was great. I'm glad you came on. I've been wanting to get you on conversations and sunglasses for a while. I knew you'd be an intriguing guest and a loquacious one. A wonderfully loqu- loquacious one. So there's Mason Pell. He's giving you all his uh, places to stalk him, all his things he wants you to do with your life. Get on it. And uh, I'm Glenn Clark. You can find my uh, writing and such at glennslateclarkjr.com, my author website. And until next time, this has been Conversations in Sunglasses. Peace out.